Hey everyone, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. In this daily editorial, we're going to recap some of the moves in the markets, especially on the interest rate and currency front this week, and then look ahead to next week, which is a very heavy central bank meeting week with the Fed, but also with a number of other central banks that we need to kind of balance out what policies are where and who's going to be cutting first. We are chatting with Mark Chandler, managing partner at Bannockburn Global Forex. Mark, when we were chatting with you off mic, you were really focused on the interest rate environment here, the 10-year as we're talking, right about at 4.3%. It's been in an uptrend ever since the very end of December when the 10-year bottomed just under 3.8%, and it's been climbing. We, we've been over 4% for most of this year outside of a couple quick drops, and Quite frankly, we're we're moving up to what could be close to about four month highs on the ten year. We're not quite there yet, but in terms of this interest rate environment, ties in with Fed expectations where rate cuts are getting pushed back. Is this the higher rates? It are does do these have you concerned about markets broadly? Yeah, sure. We did see a huge jump in rates this week. I think this is the big adjustment this week has been uh, roughly call it 20 to 25 basis point rise in both the U.S. two-year and 10-year yields. And partly I think that the two forces are going on. One is that the yields got too low after that non-farm pay, the non-farm payroll report last Friday. And like the, uh, the U.S. two-year was near 440. And, uh, you know, the 10 year, of course, was was closer to like 410. And so uh, so I think two things have happened. One is uh, that that pendulum swung too far last week and come back this week. So that's one. And secondly, I think that there was data that uh, has spooked the market, especially so close to the FOMC meeting. And by that, I mean, on one hand, we did get a higher than expected uh, CPI and PPI. But at the same time, retail sales, uh, which is a measure of consumption, about half of U.S. consumption is accounted for in retail sales these days. And that came in a much weaker than expected with that control group that economists use to forecast GDP, which excludes autos, gasoline, uh, building materials, uh, food services. And that number came in flat. So we are seeing a big pullback in the consumer just as inflation has sort of stopped falling. Well, Mark, just speaking of those inflation numbers, the CPI and PPI coming in a little hotter than expectations, a lot of financial outlets ran with the narrative that, hey, that just pushes back the idea of rate cuts even further. And that may have been what gave a little levity to the the rates, the rate of change going up so much in the 10 and the two year yield, as well as a little pop in the dollar. Do you think that's what's spooking out the markets, though? Or is there something else at play here? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that uh, a couple of things. One, I do think that the proximity of the FOMC meeting next week. And this, I think that people have the same the attitude that I have going into it. And that is that in December, the Fed showed us uh, in a dot plot. Uh, the median was for three cuts this year. So what direction are they going to change it? And I think it's asymmetrically biased. I think that most people agree now that it's more likely to go to two rather than to increase to four cuts. That said, I think that I'm also part of the consensus here that thinks there's not going to be any change. And this is any change in the Fed's dot plot. And I think this is the important point I'd say, Shad, is that I think the market didn't really understand what Powell said last time, where the bar is. And Powell, I thought, was pretty clear, for whatever that's worth, uh, that the bar, he, he said, we don't need to see better numbers. We just need to see good numbers. And so the bar then for the first rate cut is not so high. Because remember what's happening. As inflation falls, what the Fed's concerned about is the real rate. So what that means is inflation falls is the real rate goes up. And that exerts greater tightening. And we've seen some weaker economic data, like that two-tenths of a rise in the unemployment rate. And they mentioned that softer U.S. consumer. And some of the surveys show consumers are slowing down their purchases of discretionary goods. And so the Federal Reserve then wants to, what they want most of all is to be able to engineer a soft landing. 
And to do so means to still be able to look forward to uh, rate cuts later this year. And I think that the, the market now is getting a bit spooked that maybe the Fed doesn't cut rates uh, three times. And this is for the first time since I want to say last October that the Fed funds futures are no longer pricing in at least three rate cuts this year. And I think that, you know, we were talking about this before, the pendulum of market sentiment, it's, it tends to overshoot in both directions. I kind of think that last week uh, after the non-farm payroll market expectations, the rates were too low. But now I'm afraid we've gotten a bit of ahead of ourselves. And so I look for uh, the FOMC meeting next week. The changing of the dot plot is probably one of the most important events that we'll have this quarter. So putting this all in context, if we are seeing less rate cut expectations, let's keep in mind that the S&P was just at all time highs a day or two ago, two to sorry, two to three days ago. It's a percent and a little bit off of there. So look, markets are still very strong considering what they've done over the last three to four months, but maybe they're in for a bit of weakness here. We've also seen the dollar rebound, but the dollar is still just a little over 103 much lower than where it was a month ago, but higher than where it was when we started the year. How do you take all this in context here? Mark, higher rates, dollar that's kind of a mixed picture, and markets that were just at all-time highs. Yeah, so what I'm watching is on the S&P 500, I'm watching the 20-day moving average. You know, we talked, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, you know, we move, we're moving above 5,000 or just about to, and I, I expressed it in my caution. I hope it didn't sound like an old man being reluctant to, like, uh, recognize this power of the trend. But I'm watching now the 20-day moving average, and we've come back down to test it, and we have not closed below it. And uh, here we are late Friday. Uh, the 20-day moving average is about 59. 95 and we're trading 5105 so it would be the first time we'd close below it since the middle of January so i do think that this uh, that the stock market doesn't need much i think to push it down i think that we saw what's, what what sort of is the tell to me is that as the stock market was making record highs earlier this month uh, one of the large banks who do surveys of asset managers showed huge like a record amount of money pouring into the us equity market and so I think this is like uh, sort of late money in weak hands. And so I'd look for that uh, sort of along the line Chad was suggesting that maybe we get a pullback in stocks. Maybe it's sort of triggered by the higher interest rates, but maybe we have to correct and retest that 5,000 level in the S&P. Makes sense to look at the support levels and see if those are in fact triggered. And looking at those moving averages, appreciate you breaking that down, Mark. Another thing you were mentioning for next week and this relates to the currencies, is all the central bank meetings. That'll affect interest rates and that'll affect currencies. So maybe walk us through some of the key central bank meetings next week that you got your eye on. Sure. So the probably the most important one uh, besides the Federal Reserve would be the Bank of Japan. And I say it's uh, one of the most important ones, partly because it's for the first time in probably many people's careers, it's going to be a live meeting in the sense that the Bank of Japan could raise interest rates. I say could because there's a lot of speculation that they will. Uh, inflation's come out, as you know, on the firm side. The signals from uh, the central bank officials have sort of suggested they're getting ready to do so. They're the last of the major central banks that had negative interest rates that still have negative interest rates. Uh, on the other hand, I kind of think that they wait another month. Uh, here's why. It's, we've got the wage agreement already from the large unions, but not from the smaller unions, and that should still be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Secondly, we get the, the Bank of Japan will get the TANCAM survey, which is an important survey of Japanese businesses, including their uh, plans for capital expenditures uh, and, and where they think the currency is going. In addition to that, at the Bank of Japan's uh, April meeting, they will also provide new updated forecasts for the economy. And, you know, what they did recently was they revised away uh, the Q4-23 contraction, largely because of capital expenditures. Consumption still was weak. So what does it leave us here in Q1? Well, they had an earthquake on January 1st. And this is, this is just like crushed the economy in, in, as we start this year. So things like industrial production off almost 7.5%. Housing starts off. Consumption was weaker than expected. And so I think that uh, waiting another month sort of makes it makes sense, I think, from a Japanese official point of view. No need to rush this at this, at this point. We're only talking about a couple more weeks. And the other thing that happens in April 
when the Japanese had given um, subsidies to households for energy, those subsidies come off. Uh, they stop, that is, they expire uh, in April. And th so that means that inflation is going to jump up again. And for the B and that would give the BOJ, I think, the cover and justification to raise interest rates. We're not talking about a big cycle there. We're just talking about a raise, going from minus 10 basis points to flat to zero. And then maybe another hike later in the year. Uh, but so if the BOJ is the, uh, is the big meeting uh, outside the Fed, a couple of other meetings catch my eye. One is the Swiss National Bank. They're not on a lot of people's radar screens. Uh, they are, uh, have low inflation, slowing growth, and their currency has been weakening. But I think they want to be able to cut rates before the ECB cuts rates. Because if they wait till afterwards, uh, they'll have to give up uh, that sort of the pullback of the currency that they so much desired and was so expensive for them to achieve. So I think if there's a surprise there this week, uh, look for the Swiss National Bank. Could be the first of the G10 central banks to cut interest rates. Among emerging markets, we get several Latin American countries uh, meeting. Many of them will be cutting interest rates. I mean, they've already begun cutting interest rates. And that's the interesting thing. Many of them were raising rates before the Federal Reserve and now able to cut them before the Federal Reserve does. And so we've got uh, Brazil and uh, Colombia. They both are likely to cut 50 basis points as they continue their easing cycle. The most interesting one, though, is the Central Bank of Mexico. They have falling inflation, slower growth. They're overnight. They're the only country, only big country in Latin America that hasn't cut interest rates this year. In addition to those like macro background, the other reason why I think that Mexico could cut rates is really because of the calendar effect. Here's what's happening. Let's look at it backwards. June 2nd is when they have national elections. Their meeting after next week's meeting is May 9th, which means that if they do not change policy at this week's meet at this coming week's meeting, they'll have to wait till a few weeks before the national election to change policy. And I, if I understand the Central Bank of Mexico, they've had to uh, fiercely protect their independence. And to, to change policy so close to the election, I think Mars that that appearance of independence. And so my, that'd be my guess is that they'd be able to cut rates, even if it's 25 basis points uh, in this coming week, given the falling inflation, weaker growth, take advantage of the opportunity. So in May, they can really have that freedom to either stand pat or to cut rates and not be changing the direction of the cycle, but just extending it. Man, so many central banks meeting next week. That Bank of Japan could be so interesting. As you said, Mark, maybe not a big move, but the end of NERP, negative interest rate policy in Japan. Man, it took them a long time to get there. And well, they still need to get there by next week's meeting. Back to the Fed meeting, because a lot of eyes are going to be on that. Look, no one's expecting a rate cut. But as you brought up earlier, we are going to see the dot plot. We see that quarterly. That is a big focus for investors. And everyone reads into where those dots are and just how many cuts they are predicting over the next couple of years. What are you going to be watching for within the dot plot and anything else from the Fed? Yeah, sure. So I think there's a couple of moving pieces. Uh, one is, a, is where they say the Fed funds, how many rate cuts they anticipate. And I don't think they're going to change their minds. I don't think that the economic data deviated enough from expectations, their expectations, to really have them change uh, the, the, uh, the three rate cuts. So I'd expect to see that still in the March dot plot. But I think separate from the dot plot, I think the Federal Reserve is going to be telling us uh, a little bit more about how they think about QT, you know, the unwinding of the balance sheet and what they're going to, how, how they, how they would like to go forward. It may be too early to get a real game plan, uh, but I think that some, some sense of tapering in the coming month, because that's really the, the question becomes, if the Federal Reserve begins cutting rates, what about the tightening that's driven by uh, the shrinking of the balance sheet. And so I think we'll get the Federal Reserve, uh, like the ECB, uh, their argument would be that they, uh, under the current like way that banks do business, it's important to have ample reserves. And that means a large balance sheet of the central bank, bigger than it was before, say, COVID uh, struck and they had expanded again, but smaller than it is today. On the other hand, the Bank of England kind of interesting because they, the deputy governor there suggested they could unwind completely all their QE purchases. So I think that uh, important things for the Fed was going to be the dot plot and what they say about QT.
And that'll be that'll that I think will be the focus. So remember that sometimes what the market has done, I shouldn't say sometimes, but often what seems to be the case is the market here's Paolo, excuse me, here's the Fed statement that we read right away at uh, as soon as it's released. And it's only a few hundred words, so people can digest it very quickly. They react one way to the statement. And then typically they change and have a reversal during Powell's press conference, and mostly on the idea that Powell tends to be a bit more dovish. So I think that it's like careful to be trading off those headlines on the Fed statement and the dot plot, uh, knowing that the market sometimes can reverse itself on, as Powell explains what they just did. Oh, I always find the day after the statement and press conference, the one that actually shows the direction too, because you are right, Mark, we get a lot of wild swings during the press conference and right after the statement is released. Who knows? Maybe the market's going to sell off into that meeting, trying to force the Fed's hand into a rate cut. But there will be plenty for us to talk about next week on the back of all those central bank meetings. Mark, thank you very much for your time today. Always interesting chatting with you. Again, Mark is managing partner at Bannockburn Global Forex. Mark, we'll chat again next week. Have a great weekend. Good luck to everybody.